Welcome everyone. My name is Hannah Moriello and I am the director of the CPAS program in Boulder, Colorado. I am delighted uh, to have you attend the CPAS discovery se seminar series today. This seminar series began to share the impressive breadth and depth of the research from CPAS scientists who study the entirety of Earth's system science. We have scientists who do everything from explore our ocean depths to fly into hurricanes to take critical measurements to heliophysicists modeling coronal mass ejections to those who unravel the mysteries of the Arctic. And we want to share this with the public, the INCAR UCA community, and our many colleagues at universities across the globe. Just to orient you all, we are using Slido today located below the presentation screen so that you can post questions for our speakers at any time during this seminar. Questions will be revealed later during the Q&A session of the seminar. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you today two CPAS scientists, Mike Mueller and Ben Johnston, who work at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, AOML program. Ben Johnston is an atmospheric scientist that developed a passion for the weather at a young age after experiencing over two feet of snow during the blizzard of 1993. In his spare time, he enjoys Pittsburgh sports, gaming, learning to dance, and spending time with his pets. Mike Mueller is an atmospheric scientist that studies the impact of observations um, on numerical weather model forecasts. He has been a weather enthusiast since childhood and especially loved walks in the snow. Mike Mueller and Ben Johnston's talk is an introduction to NOAA's quantitative observing system assessment program with a special introduction from NOAA's Quosad Chief Scientist and Deputy Director, Lydia Kovul. Lydia, please. Thank you, Hannah. So, okay, uh, thank you again, Hannah, for the introduction. I'm gonna provide a very brief uh, overview of the Quosad program. And as Hannah mentioned, my name is Lydia Kukului. I'm the Chief Scientist and Deputy Director of NOAA COSA program. And I also work for the NOAA AOML. So a little bit of background on the COSA program. First, we know that the cost of developing, deploying, and maintaining new space-based architectures are very expensive. So there's a need to provide a quantitative information on the impact of proposed observing systems for the next planned generation of numerical weather prediction. So as a result of this, in order to address this capability gap, COSAP was established in 2014 as a NOAA program and with the primary objective of increasing the use of quantitative assessments for proposed changes to the global observing system. So currently the program is based at OER, which is one of the line offices of NOAA, also called as NOAA Research, but we have representatives from all the different NOAA line offices. So our main goal under the COSA program is to maintain, develop, and update NOAA OACC, OAC ready capabilities for environmental applications. So that helps to inform measure decisions by evaluating the impact of alternative mix of current and or proposed instruments for better understanding and prediction of the Earth systems. So the primary tools that we use under COSA are observing system simulation experiments or OACCs, and also observing system experiments known as well as data denial experiments or OACs. So what's the difference between the two? So OACs addresses today modeling systems capabilities. We have a certain number of observations and the questions are, can we do better? We want to optimize the use of current observations in current modeling systems. And that's why we do OACs. We can look at data simulation strategies, more realistic observation errors. We need to manage large volumes of data and everything needs to be done just on time. And can we leverage existing observations that exist today, but we do not use it. 
So that's what OSCs do. Now, if we want to look into the future and we want to simulate the world, that's what we do OSCs. And again, OSCs help inform decisions and it, it helps evaluate the impact of uh, current and proposed observing systems. And it can be some that we already know or some that we don't understand and we don't know about them yet. And uh, OSCs provide a platform that's ideal for these. We can do trade-off studies and also we can optimize data simulation and modeling strategies. So what do we do on the cross up? And this is my last slide. We have global atmospheric OSCC and OSC systems. We also do the same for hurricane applications. And today, Ben Johnston, the first talk, will uh, provide an example of one of the projects that we have with OSCs, with radio occultation observations and the hurricane h -Worf model. We also look into now casting applications. We're trying to implement the capability to run those OSCs on the cloud. We're also working with the Space Weather Center and NESDIS to look into a Space Weather OSC type capability replications. We are putting a lot of efforts in developing now an ocean OSC, OSC system that's going to include in the future fisheries and marine ecosystems. We also do OSCs in support of the private sector. An example of one of such projects is the Wimboard Systems. And Mike Miller will give a talk, it's the second talk on this project. And now we're also looking into potential new initiatives that identify with the different NOAA line offices. We want to expand to include fire, air quality, flooding, atmospheric rivers, and also different sim uh, sampling strategies and support field campaign applications. And with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Ben now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lydia. Okay, so uh, the title of this uh, preliminary work that we've been doing recently is The Impacts of Assimilating Cosmic to GNSSRO Bending Angle Observations on HWARF Tropical Cyclone Forecasts from the 2020 Atlantic Hurricane Season. So I'll just provide a brief background on this topic first. So previous studies have shown that assimilation of Global Navigation Satellite System Radio Occultation, or GNSSRO for short, uh, bending angle profiles in regional tropical cyclone models can produce a significant improvement in track and intensity forecasts. And this has been uh, especially notable in regions where uh, observations are more sparsely available. Now, the recently launched Cosmic 2 or C2 RO satellite constellation uh, this was launched back in summer of 2019. It's now providing an unprecedented number of high vertical resolution profiles throughout the tropics and subtropics, generally on average about 5,000 to 6,000 profiles per day. And one of the improvements uh, for this Cosmic 2 mission uh, relative to older RO missions is that it has a higher signal to noise ratio. And the benefit of this is that it allows for deeper penetration into the moist tropical lower troposphere. Uh, and as a result, uh, an increased number of observations can now be assimilated uh, at these lower altitudes. So the goal, as I mentioned, this is a preliminary study, uh, but we want to demonstrate the impact that the assimilation of C2 bending angle profiles have on TC track and intensity forecasts in the Hurricane Weather Research and Forecasting Model, or HWRF. So I'm just going to briefly describe how we can profile the atmosphere with the GNSS RO technique. So if you focus on this figure on the top, this just shows the RO geometry. So you have a GNSS uh, transmitting satellite uh, here in orbit around the Earth. Uh, and this satellite sends a radio signal, which is received by a low Earth orbiting satellite here. As that radio signal uh, pro propagates through the Earth's atmosphere, uh, it slows down a little bit due to changes uh, in density in the Earth's atmosphere. So during the occultation, that time delay of the radio signal is measured and then transformed into a vertical profile of bending angles. And then under the assumption of local spherical symmetry, an ab ABL transform is used to compute a profile of refractivity, or N, from those bending angles. And then N is a function of pressure and temperature and water vapor. Uh, and we use this equation here called the refractivity equation, where P is pressure, T is temperature, and E is water vapor pressure. So using this relationship shown here, uh, you can retrieve profiles of temperature and water vapor. Now, the assimilation of RO data in uh, models, it typically uses bending angles rather than refractivity, 
Uh, it's much more complicated than I'm able to describe here in a short presentation, but uh, a few of the reasons why is that uh, bending angles are an earlier product in the processing steps of RO data, as well as there's no lower tropospheric negative bias under super refraction conditions. Next, I'm going to show some characteristics of RO and C2 data in, in particular. So if you look at this figure here on the top, this just shows the number of radio occultation measurements that are occurring over a long time period, over the last 20 years or so. Uh, we really didn't start getting many RO observations until the Cosmic One satellite constellation was launched uh, in 2006. Uh, that provided, uh, shortly after launch, about 3,000 profiles per day, but you can see how those number of profiles per day decreased steadily with time as individual satellites within that constellation went offline. So it was time to launch a the, the successor to Cosmic One, uh, which is called Cosmic Two, of course. This was launched back in summer of 2019. And as you can see, uh, for the last couple of years, uh, Cosmic Two has been providing anywhere from 5,000 to 6,000 profiles per day on average. And one of the key differences between Cosmic One and Cosmic Two, uh, Cosmic One provided profiles globally between 90 North and 90 South. But Cosmic 2 is more focused on the tropics and subtropics. So most of the profiles from Cosmic 2 are occurring uh, in the tropics and subtropics, uh, much more than Cosmic 1 was able to provide. And like any observing system, there are strengths and weaknesses uh, for RO. Um, so some of the strengths uh, for RO is that there is a high vertical resolution uh, for the profiles, uh, gener generally around 200 meters in the lower troposphere and 500 meters in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. Um, RO has a high accuracy and uh, precision. Uh, it's insensitive to clouds and precipitation, so the signal is not blocked by the deep clouds and heavy precipitation that occurs uh, within tropical cyclones. And Cosmic 2, as I mentioned, has good tropical and subtropical coverage, uh, and the profiles are evenly distributed in local time as well. But as I mentioned, you know, all observing systems have, have weaknesses as well. Uh, one of them for RO is that not all profiles can penetrate to near the surface. Um, especially in the moist tropical lower troposphere. And also, uh, profile occurs at a specific location. It is random. Uh, we can't really predict when and where they're going to occur. It's just dependent on the orbital geometry of the satellites. Next, I'm going to uh, discuss briefly uh, some of the HWARF uh, model characteristics. So within HWARF, there are three domains, including two moving inner nests at 4.5 and 1.5 and kilometer resolution. Uh, you can see the, uh, the schematic of the HWARF domains here on the right. Uh, the light blue shading is the parent domain, and that basically includes most of uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. And then you also have the two moving uh, inner nests here, DO2 and DO3. Um, so those basically just follow the, the movement of the tropical cyclone. And then HWARF has 75 vertical levels and a 10 hectopascal model top. Uh, the data assimilation system within HWARF is GSI based, so it uh, uses 80 member GS ensemble error covariances. Uh, it also can sometimes use, uh, it can also initialize its own 40 member uh, ensemble from the GSI analysis with ensemble Kalman filter perturbations. And uh, those error covariances are triggered by the presence of the tail Doppler radar data uh, whenever that is present. Now, HWARF, uh, it can assimilate many different types of observations. Uh, of course, it can assimilate many different conventional observations, including aircraft recon data, such as drop sons and tail Doppler radar, uh, satellite winds, as well as RO bending angles. And then it can also assimilate satellite radiances from infrared and microwave uh, sounders. Uh, so the methodology that we use in this study, uh, we focused on the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, this season was the most active Atlantic season on record. Uh, we selected eight cases for study from tropical cyclones that reached hurricane strength and impacted land. Uh, these include uh, Hannah, Isaias, Laura, Marco, Nana, Sally, Delta, and Zeta. Now, the experiments that we did were data denial experiments. Uh, so what we did, uh, we turned the assimilation of, of Cosmic 2 uh, off. We named that experiment no C2. And then HWARF was run for each tropical cyclone. And then C2 assimilation was turned back on. We named that C2, and then HWARF was run again for each tropical cyclone. And for the experiments where C2 data was assimilated, uh, the RO assimilation scheme was simply left as is out of the box HWARF. So we didn't change any uh, quality control characteristics or, or any error characteristics as well. And then uh, we used the so-called consistency metric. Uh, this was developed by one of our other group members, uh, Dr. Sarah Dickcheck. 
Um, so we use that metric to evaluate the model performance. And the consistency metric, it uses the mean absolute error skill, the median absolute error skill, and the frequency of superior performance. So it uses three different metrics to assess the consistency, uh, either improvement or degradation of a forecast. So for example, for an experiment to show uh, consistent improvement relative to the control, so in this study, it would be the C2 experiment relative to no C2, uh, both the MAE and MDAE skill must be greater than or equal to 1%, and the FSP also must be greater than or equal to the, the dynamic threshold. Uh, so this threshold, uh, it is dependent on sample size. So uh, for example, uh, for a sample size of at least 500, that threshold must be at least 51%. Uh, but that threshold, it gets larger as the sample size gets smaller. Now, uh, obviously I have limited time here, so I can't go into detail uh, much more on this metric right now, but if you would like a much more detailed explanation of the consistency metric, uh, I included this link here. Uh, this is the AOML Storm Viewer. Uh, website, and there is a README that discusses uh, the consistency metric in much more detail. Um, so first, I'm going to show uh, some characteristics of the assimilated C2 observations. So uh, these uh, figures are just showing locations of the assimilated C2 bending angles. Uh, we'll just focus on this left figure first. Uh, this is showing the storm relative assimilated C2 observations for just one TC, uh, this is for uh, Hurricane Laura over a roughly nine day period. Uh, and we basically kind of call this the, the confetti uh, plot. Um, and if I, I mentioned a little bit ago that uh, Cosmic 2, it's a constellation of six satellites. Um, so there, uh, each of these different colors are just indicating observations from a different satellite within the constellation. Uh, these are labeled FM1 through FM6. Uh, but the key takeaway from this figure is that you'll notice, uh, again, these are storm relative um, uh, observations. So there are only a handful of uh, C2 profiles that are assimilated near the core of the TC. Um, so C2 is not really ideal for um, you know, profiling you know, that immediate uh, core of the, the TC. It's much better for kind of profiling the, the surrounding synoptic environment uh, of the TC, which you can see most of the profiles are located a little bit farther away from the center of, uh, of the TC. And you can see that much more clearly uh, in this table on the right. This is just showing the total amount of assimilated C2 observations for all of the TCs in this study, so all eight of them. Uh, you'll see there are three columns. That's just indicating the distance from the storm center. Uh, the left column is less than 75 kilometers. The middle is 75 to 250 kilometers. And the right is greater than 250 kilometers away from the storm center. And then uh, on the y-axis, you're seeing uh, these are different, different pressure levels. So we'll just focus on this left column for now. Uh, as you can see, there are not many observations that are assimilated you know, within a 75 kilometer radius of the storm center. Most of them are gonna be greater than 250 kilometers away from the storm center. And as you can see, you have a lot more profiles being assimilated in the lower stratosphere, upper troposphere, and mid troposphere. As you progress downward toward the surface, uh, the number of profiles that are assimilated decreases steadily, as you, especially as you work into the lower troposphere. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit ago, not all not all RO profiles are able to penetrate down into the lower troposphere, uh, especially in the tropics where there's a lot of uh, moisture present in the lower troposphere. Um, as well as, you know, there are different quality controls uh, within uh, the data assimilation scheme that can sometimes filter out observations uh, in the lower troposphere as well. Next, I'm going to show uh, some composite results from all eight of the TCs. So first, let's get an idea of where we're seeing some of the consistent forecast impacts. So I uh, briefly described what the consistency metric is a few slides ago. Uh, it's very useful uh, you know, for seeing you know, where there's consistent improvement or degradation in the track uh, or various other variables. Uh, but what's useful is you can show uh, what's called the consistency scorecard. And what that uh, figure does is it shows the consistency metrics from multiple variables compressed into one graphic. So uh, that just allows for uh, the track intensity and size forecast to be quickly evaluated altogether in the same figure. Okay, so uh, the x-axis here is showing uh, different forecast lead times uh, going out to 126 hours. And the y-axis here uh, is showing uh, the different um, variables. So for example, on the top row, we have track, then we have Vmax, minimum pressure, and the different size metrics, uh, 34 knot winds, for example. Um, and the different colors here are indicating whether there was improvement in the forecast or degradation. So 
If you see light brown or brown, that just means there was either a consistent or marginally consistent degradation in the forecast. And then the, the light green and green just uh, indicates that there is an improvement. So right away, you can see that there are a couple um, locations in the figure that stand out. Uh, first, if you look at that top row, you can see the track forecast. There is actually a consistent degradation uh, for a lot of the earlier lead times from basically uh, lead time uh, hour 30 through 72. Uh, so that was a little bit surprising, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on that in the next few slides. Uh, VMAX and PMIN, uh, it's kind of um, a mixed results where you see a little bit of improvement and, and degradation depending on what lead time you're looking at. And then if you look at the size metrics, uh, especially at middle to longer lead times, you can see that there is uh, consistent to marginally consistent improvement going on for pretty much all of those different size metrics, whether it's 34 knot winds, 64 knot winds, or the radius of maximum winds. So we'll look at uh, both of those a little bit more closely. So again, where do we see those consistent forecast impacts? Uh, so this, these figures are just showing the uh, mean absolute error and the mean absolute error associated skill. Uh, we'll just focus on the track figure. This is the one on the left here. Um, really just focus on the bottom panel here. This is showing the skill. And you can see uh, for both earlier lead times as well as later uh, longer lead times, uh, there is generally a decrease in the skill uh, anywhere from a, a couple percent to up to about 5% on average. And that correlates that very well with the figure that I just showed. You can see the consistency metric shown in this uh, bar here in the middle, where you see that uh, degradation uh, in the track uh, forecast here uh, for earlier lead times. Now compare that to the 34 knot wind radii. Uh, at earlier lead times, uh, you can see a, a little bit of a degradation, but uh, very shortly after that, once you get beyond about 48 hours or so, you, that's where you start to see the uh, consistent improvement uh, in the size metric, uh, generally anywhere from a few percent up to about you know, 15 or 20 percent uh, on average. So, you know, obviously that degradation in the track forecast is, is a little bit surprising, uh, but it's important to kind of look at which tropical cyclones from the sample uh, are contributing the most to that forecast track degradation. So you can break down uh, the consistency metric on a TC by TC basis. Uh, the x-axis is still showing the forecast lead time, but now uh, each row uh, is showing a different TC. So you can see on the top here, we have uh, HANA, and then this progresses down to the bottom uh, for Zeta. And you can see uh, there's a few TCs that just basically show mostly degradation throughout all the different lead times. Uh, those include uh, HANA here on the top, Isaias, uh, Nada and Delta. Uh, with Delta, we're basically seeing uh, degradation at almost every lead time, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, there are a few that show mixed results. Uh, those would include uh, Laura and Sally. Uh, but then there are also a few that show uh, mostly improvement, and those include Marco um, and then Zeta on the bottom. And I'll show a case study of Zeta in a few slides that uh, maybe uh, give us a better idea of why we uh, are seeing improvement in at least a couple of these TCs. But what might be contributing to that large track degradation that we're seeing? Uh, so one of the things that uh, we did was we subsetted the forecasts by the error covariance treatment that is used. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, uh, there can be two different uh, error covariance treatments that HWORF uses. Uh, one of those is the GDAS error covariances, and that's the figure here shown on the left. Uh, we'll just focus on this top row for now. This is just showing the, uh, the track uh, consistency metric here. Uh, and you can see on this top row, there's a little bit of light green, a little bit of light brown. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of mixed results, but actually in general, you see a little bit more improvement uh, than you do degradation when the GDAS error covariances are used. Now, compare that to the figure on the right. This figure on the right shows the HWARF self-cycle mesoscale error covariances with the ensemble Kalman filter perturbations. And again, just focusing on that top row, you can see there's a lot more brown, light brown and dark brown. Uh, so basically what this figure is showing is that most of the track degradation that's occurring uh, is occurring when the mesoscale error covariances are used. Uh, it's pretty surprising because previous studies have shown that mesoscale error covariances are needed for better tropical cyclone forecasts, uh, especially because they help with intercore data assimilation. Uh, so clearly what this is showing is that there still is a, a lot of work that needs to be done in optimizing the assimilation of C2 uh, bending angle profiles, uh, especially when those mesoscale error covariances are used. And then finally, I have a couple of slides here that are going to show uh, the Hurricane Zeta case study and give us a better idea of 
why is it might be showing some track improvements. Uh, so this figure here is a percentage point contribution to that track MAE associated skill. Uh, so the x-axis again is showing different lead times, but the y-axis now is showing uh, the different uh, cycle initialization times. So the top row is basically just uh, as Zeta was starting to form uh, and then progressing down toward the end uh, after it has already made landfall and is dissipating. So you can see the different colors here. We have a lot of green on the top, some brown on the bottom. The green is just indicating that's where there is uh, improvement to the, uh, the track uh, skill and the brown and red that's uh, showing when there's degradation. So you can see in these earlier um, cycles, uh, that's where there's a lot of green. So that's when a lot of the improvement is occurring. Uh, so I looked into a lot of those different earlier cycles, but we'll just focus on one cycle more closely for this uh, presentation. Uh, this is the this is October 25th at 18Z. And let's get a better idea of maybe why we're seeing some improvement uh, in the track forecast uh, in these earlier cycles. So this uh, the last figure here is showing the uh, Hurricane Zeta uh, 500 hectopascal relative humidity maps. Um, at this point, uh, Zeta hasn't quite reached hurricane strength. It's uh, a tropical storm at this point. Uh, so this is more during the development stage of Zeta. And <clears throat> these figures here are showing uh, the, the top row here is showing the C2 experiment. The middle row is showing the no C2 experiment. And then the bottom row is showing the difference between those two experiments. So C2 minus no C2. Uh, first, let's just uh, focus on this bottom left panel here. Um, so this is showing the assimilated C2 observations uh, during this specific cycle here. You can see that there are a few different uh, lines around this uh, figure. So there are a handful of profiles that are assimilated, but we'll just focus on this one profile right here, just east of the Yucatan Peninsula, this blue line right here. Uh, so that's pretty close to the center of the TC. Uh, the TC is kind of moving in this direction. And if you look at these maps here, uh, where the green and brown are being shown, these are just showing the relative humidity uh, at 500 hectopascals. And the green colors are uh, just indicating uh, high relative humidities, and the browns are indicating very low relative humidities. So you can see that there is a pretty sharp uh, moisture gradient located just out ahead of uh, Zeta there. Um, but if you look at the bottom maps here, you can see that after C that C2 profile is assimilated and kind of in that vicinity of the TC, just out ahead of it, uh, that the, the, the relative humidity is uh, kind of changed pretty significantly. So basically what this is showing is that uh, assimilating C2 profiles uh, can really provide improved moisture representation, uh, especially in challenging environments such as this one where you have this very sharp gradient occurring just out ahead of the TC. Uh, so this is kind of um, you know, a little bit of a lucky profile because you know, we can't really predict when and where those profiles will occur. This one just happened to occur uh, right along that boundary. But I think you know, this is where uh, C2 uh, profiles can be very useful in really improving that representation of moisture in those uh, challenging environments. Uh, and I believe that this is why the, the forecast is being improved in these earlier lead times because of some of these profiles being assimilated along this boundary. So just a brief conclusion uh, slide here. Um, so the results that I showed today, uh, they show that the assimilation of C2 observations in HWRF, it can both improve and degrade the track intensity and size forecast. So it's important to keep in mind that you don't just see only improvement. Sometimes you can see degradation as well. And we did see consistent track degradation, especially at earlier lead times for a lot of the TCs. However, we did see improvements for a few of them, especially for uh, Zeta uh, in, the, in the earlier uh, cycles. Uh, and it was occurring because of C2 profiles that might be assimilated along that short moisture gradient just out ahead of uh, the movement of that TC. Uh, now, the large uh, degradation in the track that we were seeing, it mainly occurred when the mesoscale aero covariance treatment was used by HWRF. Uh, that's a little bit surprising. We don't really have an idea of why it's occurring yet, so that's something that we're going to need to keep looking into uh, in, in the future work that we're going to do. Uh, but it's not all doom and gloom, right? There were still some improvements, uh, especially in the seismetric forecasts uh, that were observed at the middle to, to longer lead times. Um, and it's important to remember that the mixed results that we saw here today, they're not really that surprising, uh, especially considering that no tuning was done to the data assimilation scheme. So the upcoming work that we're going to do, uh, it will focus on tuning that RO data assimilation scheme. And we're going to be switching to NOAA's next generation hurricane model to do this work, which is called HALFS. So that is it for my talk today. And I'll take any questions um, after Mike is done with his presentation. Thanks a lot, Ben. Um, yep.
Okay, um, my name is Mike Mueller. Uh, and before I get started on the presentation, I'd like to just give a little background on myself. Um, I have been working uh, with COSAP for the last uh, almost six years. Uh, and over that time period, I've looked at um, the data impact uh, on mainly global model forecasts uh, for it usually space-based uh, observations. So we're talking about trade-off studies of uh, infrared and microwave uh, radiances, but also looking at the impact of uh, additional radio occultation data, uh, scatterometry data, uh, and other types of um, you know uh, space-based um, wind uh, der derived wind products. Uh, but today, um, I'm going to be presenting on something a little bit closer to home. Uh, here, we're going to be talking about the assimilation of windborne systems, um, long duration weather balloons, um, uh, observations in INSEPS global data assimilation system. So just getting into it here, um, windborne systems is a private company that was founded in 2019 uh, to develop long endurance balloon systems uh, with uh, one of the goals being inclusion of that data in uh, the operational data stream. These special balloons uh, were optimized for repeated vertical sampling with remote surface to stratosphere altitude control. And it's in this way that the balloons can navigate to various areas of interest uh, using the knowledge of uh, existing uh, wind direction profiles. These balloons were uh, designed to fly for a very long time and over long distances. So uh, up to 16 days and a full circumnavigation of the globe has been achieved so far. Um, and the sensors that are um, connected to the, uh, to the balloons uh, retrieve observations in near real time. So we're talking about latencies of less than 10 minutes. Um, the sensors uh, that I was talking about um, are designed to collect in situ observations of temperature, humidity, wind, and pressure throughout the depth of the troposphere and into the lower stratosphere. To date, hundreds of flights have already been conducted for um, the purposes of calibration and error estimation, and also to collect data for preliminary testing within experimental uh, modeling environments. So to that point, uh, the purpose of our study is to prepare, assimilate, and quantify the impact of windborne temperature, humidity, and wind observations on uh, forecasts in INSEPT global analysis and forecasting system. Now, obviously, uh, before we do that, we first need to collect the observations that are to be assimilated. So this plot shows 63 balloon flights from the 23rd of February to the 18th of March of last year. And this took place during uh, a much larger atmospheric uh, river field campaign that occurred in the first, uh, first quarter of, uh, of 2022. As you can see, the balloons here were launched from South Korea uh, with the most dense coverage over the North Central Pacific, but with a, an area of secondary uh, coverage over the continental United States. The observations that Windborne receives in real time uh, are in fact very high in spatial and temporal density. So we're talking about one observation every 10 seconds. Uh, so this is very high um, and it creates a challenge or a clash with the resolution um, of the global models. So in order to conduct the study, uh, Windborne super op the data uh, by averaging over 100 meter vertical layers uh, in the event where the uh, balloon was rising or descending or every 30 minutes if it was staying at a fairly, uh, fairly even level. Um, on the right, uh, you can see two time series. The one on the top is the number of balloons aloft at any given time um, over uh, about a month uh, a month period. And on the bottom uh, is the number of windborne observations per six hour cycle uh, with the green box showing uh, the period of intensive uh, observation that, um, that I showed on the previous uh, slide. Uh, this is again from February 23rd to March the 18th of 2022. And what these plots show uh, is that the uh, most balloons that were aloft um, at any given time was 18 balloons. And the, uh, the greatest number of observations per cycle uh, peaks near 3,000, but over most of the cycles, we're talking about anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500 observations. And if you compare that to the rest of the entire global observing system, it's quite small. Uh, but again, these are targeted observations uh, in areas where 
uh, we generally don't have um, we generally don't have uh, in situ observations, especially of uh, profiles. So the errors for the uh, these observations were calculated using data gathered from previous field campaigns, using uh, comparisons to nearby aircraft drop sons and radio sons. Secondly, we want to review the modeling and data assimilation system uh, that we're going to be using to determine how the observations are to be assimilated. So in this study, we're using the global data assimilation system, GDOS, and the global forecast system, GFS, uh, with the 16.1 uh, GFS version uh, and using a reduced experimental horizontal resolution of about 25 kilometers, and that's the equivalent grid spacing for the GFS and for GDOS, um, a reduced resolution of 50 kilometers. Both of these, the GFS and the GDOS, uh, are, um, are using 128 vertical layers. For our data assimilation scheme, we're going to be using a 40 EN bar GSI, or uh, grid point statistical interpolation, with 80 ensemble members uh, to more closely match the operational GFS and, uh, and GDOS. So uh, we want to know uh, how the GSI is going to be handling windborne observations, and we have a few decisions to make. So the first decision we made quite early, and that was to use existing code, uh, which is forward operators in the GSI. Uh, and there were two reasons for that. First is simply because this is a preliminary test, uh, and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so there was a little bit of an ease factor there. Uh, but also, um, and it's justified because uh, Secondly, the data is uh, already very similar to existing radio sounds and drop sounds. The question really was, um, should we treat the windborne observations as drop sounds or radio sounds? So to answer that question, um, before we ran any of the experiments, we ran a nine cycle data assimilation prelimin preliminary test that showed that the assimilation statistics were nearly identical regardless of how we treated um, we treated the windborne observations either as drop sounds or radio sounds. So we ended up choosing to assimilate the data as drop sounds uh, simply to compare um, with the assimilation of drop sounds from nearby reconnaissance aircraft during the uh, aforementioned uh, atmospheric rivers campaign. And so on the bottom, what we see uh, are six plots, and this shows uh, data assimilation statistics of uh, assimilation count with uh, wind observation count on the left temperature in the middle and uh, specific humidity on the right, with the existing control drop signs from the recon aircraft on top and windborne observations on the bottom. And what we can see over this nine cycle uh, data assimilation test is that the uh, control drop signs are more sporadic, uh, as you would expect, considering these are coming from recon aircraft that can't simply remain in the air uh, forever. Um, but also, uh, you'll note that the uh, windborne observations over all cycles are between three and four times, uh, you know, they're, they're three to four times more observations. Here's uh, assimilation statistics in terms of bias with uh, O minus B statistics in blue uh, and the uh, O minus A statistics in uh, orange. And that uh, black dotted line is zero bias. So what we see here is that the magnitude um, of the bias is similar for both the existing drop signs uh, and windborne, and that bias is reduced for almost every cycle. And this is exactly what we want to see when assimilating a new observation type. Uh, we want to compare it to um, you know, existing observations, um, but we also want to see that from O minus B to O minus A that the uh, bias and spread are being reduced. However, in the uh, lower right-hand corner, you can see the uh, specific humidity bias for windborne OBS uh, is simply too dry. So the windborne observations, it appeared had a dry bias, but we trace that back to a calculation error uh, when calculating the specific humidity. Uh, and this was an error in the vapor pressure. Um, so we found that, we recalculated, um, and then we tried it again for a couple of cycles. And we found that the bias that's shown here was actually more than halved. So we figured that at that point, uh, it was good enough to go forward uh, with the, um, you know, with the rest of the, uh, with the rest of the tests. So finally, I want to show the spread statistics. So these are the RMS statistics. It shows that RMS magnitudes are very similar uh, between the drop sons and the windborne OBS uh, with spread reductions for every single cycle. 
So this is, again, uh, exactly what we want to see. Finally, uh, when you're assimilating a new type of observation, uh, we want to see whether or not that, um, that assimilation is negatively impacting the assimilation of the existing observations. And in this case, we found that they, they were not. So this is all very good, gets a thumbs up. Um, so we can go forward to the next step, which is designing the data impact study to quantify the impact of the observations, which is what we're all here to see. So in, our, in this case, um, we're using the Observing System Experiment or OSE uh, study design. Uh, this is basically a data denial or addition experiment in which we have two types of forecasts. So the first type of forecast where we assimilate common observations, this is known as a control, and one in which um, those observations plus the observations to be studied are being assimilated. So in this case, we're running two cycle forecasts, one called control and uh, one called windborne. And this is taking place over 24 days from February 23rd to March 18th, 2022. Again, that intensive observing uh, period that I showed earlier. So the difference between these two is that the control is assimilating all operationally available observations and windborne uh, would be exactly the same as control, uh, except we're adding in the assimilation of windborne superob temperature, wind, and specific humidity, um, uh, specific humidity observations. Both of these tests have um, four data assimilation cycles per day at 0, 6, 12, and 18Z, with uh, one uh, forecast initialization per day for the GFS at, uh, at 0Z. And finally, the uh, GFS is allowed to run out to uh, the 10-day period um, so that we can have uh, longer, uh, longer term forecasts. Finally, we want to define verification methods uh, so that we'll know uh, whether or not the control or windborne is better or worse. Here, we're using two different verification methods. The first is INCEPT's VSDB package. Here, um, we have, we're comparing forecasts from both experiments uh, to uh, ECMWF operational analyses for the entire length of the uh, lead time, so all 240 hours. And here I'm showing the standard domains, which is the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and Tropics. Now you're going to see with those uh, latitude bands that these are very large areas, uh, especially with a, a limited data set uh, like the windborne observations. So, um, you know, uh, we might expect that uh, the impact wouldn't be so great on those very large areas um, over an average, uh, which is why the second verification method would be comparisons on the continental United States domain. And that domain uh, that we defined is, um, is shown in the, the, um, the plot on the bottom of the screen. Here, we're comparing the um, forecasts for both uh, experiments to the ERA-5 reanalysis but only in the first 120 hours. So we're really going to be zooming in to where the impact would be greatest uh, because that's where the concentration of observations are. Uh, but we also want to look at the first um, 120 hours, which is the first five days, um, to see um, you know, what the immediate impacts are over that area. So here are the first wave of results. Um, there's obviously a lot going on in this slide, so we'll break it down. This is wind RMSE. So since it's an error statistic, the lower the RMSE, the better. So here we have uh, the Northern Hemisphere uh, extra tropics uh, results here on the left, tropics in the middle and Southern Hemisphere on the right with upper level uh, wind forecasts on the top and um, lower level uh, wind errors on the bottom. And within each of these plots, we have, uh, it's basically a split screen. So on the top, we have the growth of error over time, which you would expect, obviously, um, over the forecast hours from zero to 240 hours, uh, with the windborne um, errors, <clears throat> or the errors from the windborne test in red and uh, for the control is in black. But we see in most, in most cases, uh, we have quite a small difference. So we have to look at the bottom, uh, bottom half of these plots which shows the difference of windborne with respect to control. So if the, um, if the red line um, is above uh, the black line, which is zero, then that means that the error for windborne is greater than the, the error for control. However, just because we have a positive score doesn't mean it's necessarily a worse forecast. 
if the, um, the, if the uh, results are not statistically significant. And you can tell significance by if this red line exceeds the uh, red boxes, which shows the 95% confidence level. So having gone through all of that, we see that the mix, the uh, results are very mixed for all three regions and for uh, both the upper level and the lower level. So there's really no clear preference for forecast improvements or degradations here uh, with this metric. Again, remember that these are very large areas that we're averaging over. With the temperature RMSE, it's actually quite similar for the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. We have very few statistically significant differences between uh, windborne and control. Um, and uh, the overall scores are quite mixed depending upon the, uh, depending upon the uh, forecast hour lead time. However, in the tropics you see, especially in the upper levels, that they're very small, but sometimes uh, statistically significant degradations when adding in windborne observations. So this is very, very interesting, but note that the impact on the tropics, even the ones that are statistically significant are up to an order of magnitude um, smaller than the impacts um, over the Northern and Southern hemispheres. Here we have geopotential height anomaly correlation. And since this is anomaly correlation, now we're looking at um, larger scores mean a better forecast. So uh, here we're looking at Northern hemisphere and Southern hemisphere and the upper levels and mid levels. These are the, the standard, um, standard regions and standard levels that we look at uh, for geopotential height forecasts. Here we see that geopotential height forecasts are neutral impact at all lead times. But we expect that simply because this metric is not observed or assimilated by the windborne observations. Um, so right now you might be thinking, well, everything's neutral. That's that's quite strange. Um, so can we zoom in maybe to a smaller region near to where the observations are, where we might see a more consistent impact of these observations? So that's exactly what we did by looking at the um, results over the continental United States. Here we're comparing again, uh, or here we're comparing the ERA-5 reanalysis. Um, and this is a scorecard. So this shows on the, I guess you would say the x-axis here. As you go from left to right, we go from 12 hours of lead time all the way out to 120 hours of lead time. And then on the, um, the y-axis going down or going from top to bottom, um, we have uh, basically just different metrics. So geopotential height, temperature, wind, and relative humidity. The important thing to note, there's two things important. The first is that the color, um, the color shows um, blue where a windborne test is better and uh, red <clears throat> where the windborne test is worse. Um, but you can also see the st uh, statistical significance of that result uh, by the, the solid sidebars, the bolded solid sidebars are 95% confidence interval. And uh, with the double bars, we have 90% confidence, confidence interval. So let's go from top to bottom and see what we can find. So obviously with the geopotential height, as in the, the previous slide, we see mixed results. This was not assimilated. We don't expect to see much of a, an impact here. Um, so very few of those results are significant. Uh, the best results, uh, the best performance by the windborne observations occur um, between uh, one and uh, one in three days. Um, but you do see more reds here uh, than with the other, the other um, variables or the other metrics. Here with temperature, we're looking at a variable that actually was assimilated. So we have no significant degradations over that time and uh, very, uh, very many improved forecasts um, in the first 72 hours at all levels. Um, and many of these uh, many of these results are statistically significant. So there is, uh, there is a, a statistically distinguishable spread between windborne and control, and the windborne is better. So here are the two windborne components, the U and the V. This shows, again, improved forecast, many significant uh, forecast, uh, results uh, in the first 60 hours. Um, and then it sort of moderates after that. Uh, however, there are no significant degradations. And here for relative humidity, we see, again, um, statistically significant improvements in the first 60 hours with uh, neutral impacts after 72 hours. And again, no significant degradations. So in conclusion, um, we see that um, 
you know, with the preliminary data assimilation uh, tests, uh, we had a success with uh, bias and spread statistics decreasing from uh, O minus B to O minus A. This is all very good things. And also the, the um, assimilation does not negatively impact uh, the other observations data assimilation. As for results and the total impact of windborne uh, observations on the forecasts, northern and southern hemispheres, you know, very large areas, um, these impacts are statistically neutral. Um, but in the tropics, uh, especially the upper level tropics, uh, with the temperature forecast, we have some small but significant degradations. However, when we zoom into the area that's uh, most likely to be impacted uh, by the uh, windborne observations, given where, where the sampling occurred, uh, which is over the continental United States, all of the variables, you know, all of the fields that were assimilated, temperature, humidity, and wind, these were all significantly improved in the first 60 hours of the forecast. So I would say that overall, uh, while um, the data assimilation system is not optimized uh, for you know, using the windborne observations as a first cut, this is very, uh, very uh, exciting and um, I, I would say promising uh, results for the windborne observations. So our next steps uh, would be basically to address the shortfalls of, of the current study, which is um, we're currently running a second season of experiments with uh, double the uh, double the sample size. So we're talking about 46 days versus the 24 days I'm showing here. And it's also uh, taking place during the Atlantic hurricane season. So we can see how, um, how the assimilation of windborne observations would uh, impact individual high impact storms. And finally, if, uh, you know, obviously if these results are showing degradations in the tropics again, um, then we might have to be doing a more extensive study on how to uh, mitigate or fix it, considering that we're already getting um, pretty good results and uh, over the CONUS. So um, that is, uh, that's it for my presentation. And I think that concludes the presentation. So um, any questions? And I will stop share screen and uh, we'll take your questions. Thank you so much for sharing your great work, uh, Ben and, and Mike, and, and also uh, our sincere thanks to you, Lydia, for uh, this special introduction today. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Um, now to the Q&A portion of today's seminar. Uh, I'd like to direct everyone's attention to the QR code on your screen. Please enter your questions here for our speakers. And while you're doing that, I would like to invite you all to attend our next CPAS uh, seminar on Wednesday, February 22nd. And we will have our CPAS scientist, Lynn Hart, uh, give her presentation. She is working at NOAA's Southeast Fisheries Science Center. So we look forward to her presentation and seminar uh, on February 22nd. Let's see if there are any questions uh, from, from the audience. As we are waiting for some uh, possible questions, uh, Ben, I very much uh, enjoyed your uh, presentation and uh, we look forward to hearing more about your upcoming work that will focus on uh, tuning the our data assimilation scheme in NOAA's next generation hurricane model. And of course, uh, for you, Mike, uh, it was very interesting also to uh, look at all the great data that you have collected and also uh, perhaps awaiting the uh, second season of experiments uh, where you're 46 days versus 24 days during Atlantic hurricane season. season. I believe the dates you had were uh, 15 August to uh, October 1st of 22.
Thank you, Anne, for your, your comment. Very much appreciated. So here we have a question. Why did many of the weather balloons start their trips in South Korea? Mike, I think that was a question for you. Yeah, yeah, I can handle that. So um, the field campaign for uh, the windborne observations were, was set to basically coincide with or be complementary with the uh, atmospheric rivers campaign, which was occurring over the Pacific. So one of the areas that they had, uh, that they already uh, were able to um, basically go to and then launch those balloons from would be South Korea. Uh, and that was the, the location that they decided to, to launch from. But the idea was that they would launch on the Western side of the Pacific and then float the balloons over the, over the, um, the Central Pacific where uh, most, of the, uh, most of the observations were being done at the time. So I think that it was just, you know, I guess they could have also launched from Japan as well, but I think that they just already had some relationships in place where they could, they could go to South Korea. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, I would like to thank all of you for coming to our UCAR CPAS Discovery Seminar today. And also just remind you that uh, you can go to our website to find our future talks uh, at cpas.ucar.edu. And here you will also find the link for today's uh, seminar that will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, ben, Mike, and Lydia, our sincere thanks uh, to all of you for uh, sharing your important research with us. Uh, thank, thank you also to uh, Brett Batterman, our UCA Multimedia Services Specialist for his invaluable assistance. And I hope to see you all on February 22nd for our next CPAS Discovery Seminar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, calling in today. Thank you.